interested in what you have to tell us tonight. And uh, we'll just ask you uh, to uh, speak now and, uh, and then close in prayer. And uh, we have another hymn at the conclusion of the meeting. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, that was a memorable night for me too. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was actually, it was a good thing. It uh, gave us time to chat going back and forth and enjoy the fellowship. It was very good. Um, <clears throat> thank you. We've enjoyed being here. Um, it, it's always a blessing. Um, I would much prefer being there with all you folks because there's just a blessing of seeing all, all of you folks that I've known over the years. And so thank you. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to have Zoom, but it's not personal, is it? It's very, uh, very different. I'm going to share my screen here. As you know, I try to use uh, slides to make some sense of what I'm saying. Um, is that up on your screen now? Yeah, it's up, brother. Thank you. Okay, um, so we're going to continue, as Charlie said, with uh, God's wondrous works. Um, when I think of God's wondrous works, it's, it's just a passage of scripture that I've captured in my mind. And I've mentioned to you before that um, the words wondrous works are mentioned 10 times in the Old Testament. And it's worthwhile to look them up and just see what they have to say. It's quite amazing. Um, one of the wonderful works, wondrous works that God does is the ascension. We're going to look at the ascension part two tonight. And um, this is the work of the Lord on earth. The, this morning, I, I was sort of going at breakneck speed, I felt, and um, I hope you actually caught some of it. <laughs> but I'll try to slow down tonight, and I'll uh, try to not go over time. Um, the work of the Lord on earth, it, it's, of course, there's the work of the Lord in heaven when the ascension first takes place. And what we talked about this morning, the Lord, our uh, mediator, our high priest, our prophet, our king. And I'm sure there's many other things, but they're the ones that, um, that we know about that he does that are highlighted by, by many people and by the scriptures. But I want to just take and show you one quote about God's wondrous works. I like uh, Adam Clark's commentary and I, I reference it a lot. And um, Job 37, 14 says this about the wondrous works. It says, listen to this, O Job, stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. Stand still and consider, listen. So here's what Here's what Adam Clark wrote about that. He says, hearken on to this, or hear this, stand still, enter into deep contemplation on the subject, weigh everything, examine separately and collectively, and draw right conclusions from the whole. The wondrous works of God are endless in their variety, stupendous in their structure, complicated in their parts, indescribable in their relations and connections, and incomprehensible in the mode of their formation, in the cohesion of their parts, and in the ends of their creation. The wonder, that is some description of the wondrous works of God. You know, if we, if, if as the, uh, the passage in the Psalms says, if we just stop and think about the glories of the Lord, as we read them and who he is and um, just the heart of God. It just shows us who he is and his motivation, his character, his uh, incredible attributes. Oh, the glories of our God. So one of the things that is a glory of our Lord is um, just the triune God himself. Um, I'm sure that a number of you have read a number of books about the triune God, and I'm sure that there are very few that you have not wanted to reread. But here's what a Bible commentary says about the, the triune God. He says, the Bible teaches that in every activity of God, God the Father authors it, 
The Son, Jesus Christ, arranges it, and the Holy Spirit brings it to completion. And, you know, I've never, I've never had that extensive a study to be able to make a comment like that, but it, it just seems to make some sense. The Father authors it, so it starts with him. The Son, Jesus Christ, is making it happen, and the Holy Spirit brings it to completion. It's always the triune God. And then this author says, therefore, the Holy Spirit is working in every phase of divine activity as he always has been. So we're going to um, go forward about Christ and the Holy Spirit tonight because the work of God, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on earth is through the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is always connected to the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The, when the Son was on earth, the Holy Spirit worked um, with, um, I'm trying to figure out where my sentences end and start here. Once I sort that out, I'll be fine. Uh, works in and through the believers, the church, and the Spirit of God presently implements the work of God of the sun on earth so um the church is the church is the work of the lord jesus christ he's put in charge of the church of course god father would have authored it god the lord jesus christ would have done the work to get it to that point and then he hands it to the holy spirit to carry it on according to the will of christ the will of god um it's important to understand that what happens is that God presently implements the work of God that comes through the Son on earth to the Holy Spirit. Um, I think we're going to just go through a series of things that will just show you the activity of the, the Holy Spirit on earth. When the Son ascended to heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit into the believers and they started the church. A new ministry was created for all men, the church, the body of Christ. This is a group of believers who love the Lord Jesus and are doing the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are told in the scripture clearly that Christ says, I will build my church. So it, this work is going to continue as all things that God has said um, will continue exactly as he said. So it's not a suggestion that he was going to ascend, he ascended. It's not a suggestion he was going to send the Holy Spirit, he sent him. All of these things happen because once God says the word to do something, it's done. So Christ will build his church, but he will build it. The worker on earth will be the Holy Spirit doing the will of the Lord Jesus, which of course is doing the will of the Father. What is the ascension? For Christians, there are a few more, very few more important historical events than this one. One of the wondrous works of God was when the Lord Jesus Christ was taken up bodily into heaven to be seated at the right hand of his father. The ascension of the Lord Jesus was a pre -pran I call it a trigger because it's, it's like... It's like the word, I think it's like the word, I thirst, when the Lord Jesus Christ was on the cross. I don't think that that just happened and all of a sudden it dawned on the Lord Jesus that um, that was the only thing that wasn't finished. I believe that was a planned thing, that when you get to that and he says, I thirst, that everything is completed then. And it says that the scripture may be fulfilled, he said, I thirst. I think that the ascension of the Lord Jesus was a planned trigger which was set, set in motion the next steps of God's great plan. So what did he do? Well, it began when he ascended, he began the new work of Christ in heaven. And secondly, he began the new work of Christ on earth. Um, and here's how it, it's written up in Acts chapter one. Now, when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. 
And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood with them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go. So that was the action of the actual ascension that, was, that took place. He was taken up. But there was a condition that was placed on the coming of the Holy Spirit. And because Christ said that the Holy Spirit could not come until he, Christ, had returned to heaven. So the Holy Spirit's coming to earth was conditional on the ascension. Then, when the ascension and the enthronement of the Son was complete, the Son, the Son's promise to us to send the Holy Spirit could be acted on. That's what it tells us in John 16. So the purpose, why was the Spirit of God sent? He was sent to be present with and in God's people. He was sent to empower God's people for the work of the Lord. The gospel would be preached, the church would be established, believers would be taught and guided, and believers would be prayed for. And he was sought, taught, sent, sorry, to confirm, conform, or transform believers into the image of the Lord. And finally, he was sent to reach people across the world with the gospel. That's a pretty big agenda, and there's many parts to that. But um, I'm just going to go through those very briefly to show you some of the work of the spirit of god the question that always comes to my mind and i know it's, re it's a redundant question because christ promised the holy spirit and he told us from the gospel some of the things that the holy spirit would do but the thing that always comes to my mind if you see what the holy spirit is actually doing where would we be without him it's it's to me it's it's staggering because we see what he what he's actually doing um so Acts 1.8 says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in, in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So the Holy Spirit is going to broaden the ministry and take it across the world. So Christ promises this, he had promised the Holy Spirit before the cross. The Spirit of God will be sent when Christ returns to heaven is what is what he said would happen. So he said this, John 7, 39. He spoke concerning the Spirit to whom? 739. To whom believing in those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So, obviously, that means that when he would be glorified, the Holy Spirit would be given. But he wasn't as of before the cross, so he couldn't come. The Holy Spirit couldn't come. Nevertheless, I tell you, it's to your advantage that I go away. For I do not, if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And then finally, it says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring you to remembrance of all things that I said to you. And Luke 24, behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you that you should tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power on high. So all those promises all reflect the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ had to come before the Holy Spirit could come. And then he makes, the Lord Jesus makes some final promises on Ascension Day. And those promises are these. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. So they're to wait, but he says that the Holy Spirit's coming. Wait for the promise. Acts 5, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Well, we know in retrospect that uh, that was seven days from the day that Christ ascended. And then Acts 1, 8, 
You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and the other, uttermost parts of the earth, the end of the earth. So these were the promises on Ascension Day. And then we get the promises that are kept. Uh, in Acts 2.32 says, in Jesus, this Jesus, God has raised up, of which we were all witnesses, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now and see. So the timing was perfect. The plan was perfect. The, the, from, the cr creation, from the crucifixion to the resurrection is three days. From the um, resurrection to the ascension was 40 days where the Lord Jesus Christ was teaching concerning the kingdom. And I think that in that time he was teaching, and we have some of it recorded, but he was teaching what would happen to the, uh, the disciples and then teaching of the kingdom, it tells us. So, and then on Ascension Day, from there, which would be the 43rd day after crucifixion, seven days later, the Holy Spirit came. And the impact on the world on the 43rd day, when the Lord Jesus Christ was exalted into heaven and seated at the right hand of God and began his heavenly ministry, and the what took place on earth when the Lord Jesus Christ sent the Holy Spirit to do the work in the church was as big a happening as anything in terms of us and the church and people coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ as could happen. So uh, these are big days. The Holy Spirit comes into every believer. Now, um, the promise was that they would be filled with the spirit, that the spirit would come upon you. And um, it says here in um, Acts 2.38, then Peter said to them, repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, everyone receives the gift of the Holy Spirit. And uh, that's not something they have to wait for. They get that when they are saved. So this they they repent and they receive the holy spirit and that work is done by the lord jesus christ who sends the spirit in them to do this work well then the holy spirit is the seal or the guarantee of a new life for each believer the holy spirit is in you the power of god is active in doing the will of the father in you and you have the guarantee of what Christ will do in your life, in our lives. It's a guarantee because he's told us what he will do. And uh, that's, that's a, tremendous, a tremendous thing to know that we have this guarantee. The Holy Spirit, Peter Lewis says this. He is the design, divine executive in all the works of God. He brings to pass daily and at ground level, as it were, all that is decreed or directed from above, he is the personal activity of God working upon us and in us. Very busy, very busy person, the Holy Spirit. And he is the divine executive, putting everything into work. When I was uh, talking to Marilyn about this, I said, it's kind of like, I'm, I'm a retired businessman. Um, that's the best job I've ever had is being retired. Um, and the president would make a decision or form a strategy, probably with others, but he was the one that made the decision and, and would say that we're going to implement this. The vice president would be handed off to the vice president who would then arrange everything that had to be prepared to make it happen. And then he would hand it to a manager. And the manager would go out and make it happen. Um, the vice president would check on him and make sure the work is being done the way it was planned. And the president would get reports back and make sure the strategy's there and they would all be supporting to make sure it was happening the way they had intended. It's kind of like God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God the Father authors these things. The Son 
puts it into place and has the resources. And then the Lord, the Holy Spirit goes out and gets it done. And he's the divine executive that makes it happen. So the Holy Spirit in the church. Everything that Christ communicates to us. Now, this is a, this is a, a thought that I'm communicating to you that did not originate with me. It's too big for me, but um, the, the thing about this is that I can, I can understand it, but I can't say I've done the research to support it, but I, I think it's correct. Everything that Christ communicates to us, gifts of grace, love, joy, he commu communicates by the Spirit. And everything that the Holy Spirit works in us, he brings from the Son. The Spirit is the means of mediation and blessing, and the Spirit prays and intercedes for us. He does the work at our level, and it up it goes to the Lord Jesus Christ and to the Father. So it's coming down from the Father and through the Son to the Holy Spirit, and it's coming back up from the Holy Spirit to the Lord Jesus Christ to the Father. Now, the Holy Spirit is a gift beyond compare. He's an enabler. Um, there's a book that actually was the EPI book called God in Us, written by Bill Ewell. And um, Bill comments about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He lists 25 critical ministries of the Spirit, ministries for us and groups them into five categories. And there they are, salvation, experience, instruction, service, and sanctification. He actually has two chapters in there on sanctification because there's so many things that the Holy Spirit does in order to sanctify us. And so the work of the Holy Spirit in our life is extensive. Christ said the Holy Spirit could not come until he returned to the Father. What would we be without the Spirit of God? What would we be? And then the work of the Spirit on earth. Um, the worldwide ministry, the church, working with the Lord in the ministry of multiplication. That's God's plan. Before the church could begin, the Lord Jesus Christ had to die and rise again and ascend into heaven. But the ministry of multiplication had to begin. There, it had to happen. That, well, one for one reason, it was God's plan. But for the second thing is he needed that for distribution of the truth to other people. The Spirit is preparing us for eternity in heaven as well. So he's got that job that he does. And I love that 2 Corinthians 3.18 passage where he's working in us to change us from glory to glory into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit gave birth to the New Testament church. That day, as you know, about 3,000 souls were saved and baptized and filled with the Spirit of God. Isn't that something? That was a good day's work. The work of the Holy Spirit on earth. So why did we need this ministry of multiplication? Well, while the Lord was ministering on earth, he was one voice limited by his location and his humanity. But when he ascended into heaven and he could send the Holy Spirit, he could then take salvation and make it available to all men in every country on every continent until God's kingdom comes. To do this, God would launch a church program uh, from heaven for thousands of voices. They would be filled by the Spirit. They would be bearing witness and walking testimonies. They'd be spreading the truth and the hope of the gospel story to people around the world. God's church continues to grow. Even today, perhaps even more. I don't know if you had a chance to see a, a video that came out recently about the growth of the church in in uh, China and um, various various countries that uh, 
you'd never think of that would have the, the church growing there, but they're getting the word of God and they're believing the, the Lord Jesus Christ. And they're, they've got underground churches that are by the thousands. In one, one country we heard of recently, they have 10,000 pastors being trained just to teach the people to try to meet the demand. And so nothing can stop what the Holy Spirit's doing on earth. It's not pandemics. It's not persecution. It's, it, there's nothing, there's nothing. There's not even governments that oppose, that oppose the gospel. The work of the Holy Spirit's going ahead and he's using human voices and the conviction of the Holy Spirit to take it forward. That's God's church that continues to grow even today. Perhaps it's growing more than ever today. I, I would not be surprised if it were through all of this. I, one person said uh, that we were listening to the other day, um, persecution is the engine in the spread of the gospel. And one of the things he said is the book of Acts is a book of persecution. And look at how the gospel has spread throughout Acts and through the churches. So the Lord was one voice. Now there are many. Lord Jesus is head over the church. Christ had been given the authority as head of the church. The, his job was to administer the operation of the church. The Spirit of God does the work of the Son of God on earth. The Spirit fills every believer in the church and equips them in the ministry. One chapter, and I would invite you to read this. We won't take time to read it tonight. But one chapter regarding the Spirit's work for us is Romans 8. And I'll just give you two of the verses. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, note the word in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For the law of the spirit in Christ Jesus, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. That's two verses out of uh, 30 some odd. Um, that talks about what we have in Christ and you can our salvation and the guidance of the spirit has freed us to walk a new life in that passage in Romans you will find at least a dozen things that the Holy Spirit's doing for us that only the Holy Spirit can do that's that's the work of the spirit in our lives it's not only powerful and authoritative but it's unique and then there is an indescribable goal of the Spirit of God. This, this thing, uh, this act of the Holy Spirit is breathtaking to me. The, the Holy Spirit has a goal of conforming you and me and every Christian into Christ's image. That's what it tells us. This is beyond imagination that the Holy Spirit would work in order to change us into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Conformed means to be adjusted or modified to be like some something or someone. So what we have is the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ in his image of his glory and the Holy Spirit is going to work in each of us. Now, I, I know that Charlie needs work. And, and I know that some of the other guys that are there needs work and I need work, but we don't need the same work. The Holy Spirit's not taking a paintbrush and he's painting everything white. No, he's, he's got to work with each one of us according to what it takes for us to be conformed into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and the Holy Spirit has the work to do to do that. Romans 8, 29 says, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined. He predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Two Thessalonians. God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the spirit and belief in the truth. To which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Moreover, he says in, in verse chapter Romans 8.30. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called, and whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. It's hard to imagine 
what that means. But it's also hard to imagine that the Spirit of God would work that intently to conform us to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the ascension was the catalyst to begin the wondrous works in heaven and the wondrous works on earth through the Spirit. It's God's wondrous works, isn't it? God on his throne in heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ seated at God's right hand, governing the universe. The Holy Spirit is involved with every aspect of every life of every believer on earth. Everyone, one by one, singly working with us. We are saved and equipped to serve our Savior. Bill Ewell provided a quote in his book and an observation actually from A.W. Tozer, where Tozer says, the idea of the spirit held by the average church member is so vague as to be nearly non-existent. I personally took that as a warning to say, I ought to do more to know who the Holy Spirit is. Oh, that we could know him better, but we thank the Father and the Son for sending him. Why does the ascension matter to us? Well, first, the Christian can find rest, assurance, and freedom in Christ. Secondly, we are made to an import, be an important part of God's worldwide church ministry. Third, God's people are empowered by the Spirit to share the gospel. We, we can obey God's leading through the Spirit who's working in us. We are being conformed to the image of Christ. We have the God-man in heaven and as a guarantee of our eternal future in heaven. And the Lord is seated in heaven, our mediator, prophet, priest, and king, doing his work. So it's being worked from heaven and it's being worked from earth. And in the middle of it all, we have this incredible blessing. And there's not so much as a fingerprint from us on any of it because it's all done by God. So finally, the promise of the Spirit of God. So here's what it all boils down to. In him, you also trusted. You heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance in the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. That's that's the Holy Spirit. That's the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ that came a result of him seated at his father's right hand in heaven. Thank you. God bless. Now, I, I'm supposed to pray, right? Okay. Father, we thank you that your gospel is clear. It's simple. Your, the fact that the father sent the son to be the savior of the world. The fact that the son sent the Holy spirit to do the work on earth and, and take the gospel to the whole world and change us into the image of Christ and build us up and strengthen us and teach us the truth and guide us. And all, all that the Holy spirit has done, father, all we can do is simply say, thank you. We have nothing to offer. So father, we pray that as a group, we would be able to, once more, consider the wondrous works of God. We thank you for just showing us this truth. Although it's simple and we can recite it quickly, it's as complex as anything ever could be. And the more we dig, the more we love you and your son and the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, Don, thank you very much on behalf of the assembly for the last two Sundays and the messages and the time that you spent preparing to teach us. So it was just great. I'm going to ask Scott to put up our uh, last hymn. And uh, at the conclusion of that, you can uh, wave goodbye to uh, friends and foes alike. And, uh, and uh, we will gather again Thursday. Thank you. Day by day, and with each passing moment, strength I find to 
meet my trials here Trusting in my father's wise bestowment I've no cause for worry or for fear He whose heart is kind beyond a measure Gives unto each day what he deems best Lovingly, it's part of pain and pleasure Mending toil with peace and rest Every day, the Lord himself is near me With the Spirit all my cares He fain would bear and cheat me He whose name is counselor and pen The protection of his child treasure Is a church that on himself he lay as thy days, thy strength shall be in measure. Tis the pledge to me, he me. Help me there in every tribulation. So to trust thy promises, O Lord, that I lose. Sweet consolation Offer me Within thy holy word Help me then When toil and trouble meet Here to take As from a father's hand One by one Days the moments fleeting till I reach the promised land. Great song, Steve. Thank you. Thank you, Don.